I will start my lecture by uh, going back to something that uh, I was uh, doing uh, yesterday, but it was in the last few minutes and I think I butchered it pretty badly, so it's better to uh, say where, where I was wrong. So first of all, so we discussed the uh, supersymmetric field theory on the cylinder and uh, we discovered that uh, it has uh, four supercharges all transforming under the uh, SC2 left isometry of the three sphere but uh, uh, they're not transforming under SC2 right and uh, um, I brought these commutation relations but uh, if you look at your notes you will discover that uh, I did miss up, mess up a sign I think this sign was with a minus, uh, but uh, it is a plus. So, and that actually has uh, important consequences. Uh, so yeah, actually the algebra with the minus, I don't think does even make any sense. So this is uh, the correct one, uh, hopefully. So I uh, did not rewrite the entire thing, but just uh, the ones, the, the more relevant ones. And uh, then there was also a comment uh, about uh, if this is really s 2 slash 1 times u1 and uh, I think uh, indeed as Bruno was saying uh, if you redefine uh, define some operator p as uh, hl plus r uh, then indeed um, you can replace the commutator between r and q with the commutator between p and q because h uh, commutes with q and then this is the operator which appears in the SU2 slash 1 um, super algebra. So then uh, the SU2 slash 1 will contain the operator P and uh, the extra uh, R factor or U1 factor is generated by H. So indeed uh, the super algebra is SU2 slash 1 times U1 times uh, you also have the SU2R which doesn't act on any of the supercharges. <coughs> So then we discussed uh, what are the, uh, what's the representation theory uh, of this uh, super algebra. And um, so there are two kinds uh, of long multiplets. Uh, one happening for when the spin is greater than a half. And uh, then it is uh, comprised, uh, or in the long multiplets happen for h, which is uh, greater or e than uh, 2j plus 2 minus r, well, greater or equal. So then you have uh, all this, uh, so you have an entire, uh, so in this notation, this uh, indicates the spin, the maximum spin of the uh, multiplet under S2 left. And uh, so there is an entire multiplet of spin j with the r charge r and the uh, um, value of uh, h equals to little h and then there will be two multiplets one with j plus a half and one with j minus a half and uh, the r charges are shifted by one but the same value of h because all the supercharges commute with h so like h always stays the same and then finally there is uh, uh, at level two another uh, multiplet with spin j and r charge r minus two and uh, so this is fine for j greater or equal than a half. When j is equal to zero, you lose the multiplet, uh, which would have a j minus a half, uh, and you're left with, uh, with this. E and uh, then uh, we looked at what happens uh, when the multiplets are short. So the short multiplets happen either for h equals to 2j plus 2 minus r, so again, here yesterday I had the sign of R wrong because, uh, because I had the sign of that R over there wrong. And also there is another thing that I should say that uh, here I am suppressing L. So I'm setting L to 1 or otherwise you could put an L in front of H, I guess. Um, a, uh, so OK, so there, are, so there are two kinds of uh, short multiplets. Uh, there is one which uh, uh, as uh, j uh, with uh, r charge r and uh, this value of h and then another multiplet with uh, spin j plus a half so it's basically like a long multiplet but it's missing the j minus a half and the uh, and the level two uh, level two guy and then there is 
a very short multiplet, uh, which is the singleton, which is comprised of something which has h equals minus r and uh, j equals 0, and nothing else. Okay, so then, um, given the structure, you can study how these multiplets uh, can, uh, how the long multiplets split into short multiplets. And uh, indeed, let's look at what happens when this multiplet hits the, uh, the saturation bound. Then you can split it in a short multiplet of this form. So, which, so you take the level 0 one. So that would be j r. And then h is going to be equal to 2j plus 2 minus r. Okay. And uh, so you want this kind of short multiplet, so you will have another j plus a half of uh, 2j plus 2 minus r and r minus 1. Uh, but this only takes care of two parts of the long multiplet. You still have two multiplets to take care of, and those have to become another short multiplet, which should still be of this kind. So le let's check that that is indeed the case. So now the top component of the short multiplet will be j minus a half with r charge r minus 1 and uh, the same uh, h, 2 g plus 2 minus r. And uh, the relation between the charges here should be the same as the relation between the charges over there. So in particular, indeed, you can write this as 2 j minus a half plus 2 minus r minus 1, uh, because this minus 1 cancels with this plus 1. So indeed, the relation of the charges is the same. Uh, and then you are like left with uh, j r minus 2 and uh, 2 j plus 2 minus r. So indeed, this long multiplet here uh, splits into two short multiplets uh, of this kind when uh, j is greater than or equal than a half. Then you have to figure out what happens to this long multiplet. And uh, there is the same story, except that uh, the, this long multiplet will split into a short multiplet of this kind and one singleton. So this you can check by yourself. And then you can try to write down uh, the most uh, general index that will count these multiplets uh, up to recombination. And also here, I have messed things up. So, so this index should be a sum over all the spins and, uh, well, and all the h's uh, in your theory of uh, some constant alpha j that in principle can depend on h. Uh, well, let me put the h dependence there. So we have constant alpha j times the number uh, of uh, multiplets, uh, short multiplets of spin j and uh, charge h. Uh, and then there would be, so by this I mean the number of these short multiplets. And uh, then the parenthesis here. And then I'll have uh, uh, sum over h. That's no. So sum over j of this. And then I have some coefficient beta times the number of. Uh, singletons uh, with charge h. And now here I can sum over h. And uh, I could put some fugacity for h. So again, like uh, as you see in these recombinations, like because h is uh, commutes with everything, like uh, the, the value of h for the multiples doesn't change. So this is uh, uh, some index. And then, like uh, as uh, I was uh, discussing last time, you can figure out what alpha j's and betas have to be. 
uh, in order for this thing to be an index under those recombinations. And you find that uh, alpha j has to be equal to minus alpha j plus a half, or j minus a half. And then that uh, alpha a half should be equal to minus beta. And therefore, uh, you can write down what uh, the answer should be. So what you get is uh, the trace of uh, minus 1 to the f uh, times e to the minus beta h. Are brackets missing? Uh, and the multiplicity? Or yeah, see, there is still. I cannot write things straight. OK, so this is indeed uh, the, so it has the form of some uh, Witten index. And actually, uh, if we had been uh, even more, uh, well, we, we could have put even more labels, because the multiplets can also have spin uh, under the other uh, SU2, the SU2 right. So I could, in principle, add also fugacities for the, for the SU2 right. So, and if I have conserved flavor charges, then I can put even more fugacities here. As long as I have operators which commute with all of the supercharges, I can always add uh, fugacities for them. And uh, is this likely conclusion the H there? Because it's not really the H there. Uh, it's H over L. What do you mean it's not really H? So this one is the one that uh, tells what is the BPS condition. No, that's H. So this is H, which is the operator which uh, which uh, which commutes with all of the Qs. Uh, yes. So it's not the one which sets the BPS condition. The operator which sets the BPS conditions, you, you could, for instance, select one particular supercharge, say Q1, and then you could sum of only over states which have uh, q bar 1, q1 equal to 0. And that basically gives rise to this kind of condition. So, but this h does, is not the operator that sets the, the uh, yeah, this, this is not the operator that sets the BPS condition. It's just, uh, it's just like uh, uh, an operator which commutes with all of the supercharges. Okay. So, all right, so we have this uh, we have this object now. We can. Uh, uh, so, sorry, I, I think you said it, but uh, the, the equality. So alpha, the conditions alpha j equals minus alpha j minus one half and alpha yeah and alpha half equal minus. These conditions are in full, so that uh, when two short, short multiplets can combine yes. into a long multiple, they should not contribute. Exactly. So we can indeed write down the more, more general index, uh, supposing that we have some uh, other conserved charges. Then we can write trace of minus 1 to the f. We can introduce two complex numbers, p and q. Then we can write p to the j3 left plus j3 right uh, minus r over 2 plus 1 times q times uh, j3 left uh, minus j3 right uh, minus r over 2 plus 1. And we can also insert some fugacity for some flavor charges that I have in my uh, system. And I am supposed to take the trace over the Hilbert space on S3. And uh, you can see that uh, if p is equal to q, uh, e to the minus beta well, over L, uh, then this, yeah, this just becomes uh, this guy over here. That's OK. Um, well, you have to use the fact that uh, h is equal to 2j plus 2 minus r. <coughs> OK, so uh, le let's, uh, oops. So now we can, so we can interpret this, uh, this index also as the partition function of uh, our theory on 
uh, S3 times S1, where the radius of S3 is L and the radius of the S1 is beta. So this should also be uh, the partition function of our theory on S3 times S1. Uh, and this is radius L and radius beta. And uh, from this uh, discussion, we see that uh, the answer can only depend on the ratio between the two radii. So in particular, it does not depend on the size of the manifold, but only on the ratio between the two, the two radii. <coughs> so, so, sorry, I want to make sure. Uh, yes. So P, Q, and U. U is some other fugacity if you have some other flavor symmetries. Okay, but, but are they related to so alpha J and, and beta? Yeah, no, beta, yes. So beta over, so if you take P, so this is more general because I've turned on also the fugacity for the J3 right, which is the other, the other rotation. Is that, is that expression more general than? Yeah, so this expression is more general than that. And it reduces to that expression if you take Q equal one, and then you take P equal Q equals E to the minus B over L. But, but then can you motivate that expression using the, the same logic? Yes, I said, because you have other charges that commute with all the Qs, you can introduce fugacity for those. So you can choose a cartan in the S2 right, and you can add it. So that will be P over Q. And, uh, uh, you can, uh, and you, then you can introduce flavor charges. So I will have more to say about the interpretation of P and Q later, but uh, uh, the interpretation of U, we can also give a different interpretation for U. Instead of saying, well, we can add fugacity into the trace, we can also say, well, we could add a background gauge field which couples to the conserved, uh, conserved current corresponding to the flavor symmetry, and we can put it uh, along the S1. And then we can compute this partition function, where besides having the fields, the, the background fields that we talked about last time turned on, we also have this other background gauge field which wraps around the S1. Uh, and this is a background gauge field for the would-be conserved uh, flavor, uh, flavor symmetry. Uh, so this gives a geometrical interpretation for this U, and uh, for the geometrical interpretation of P and Q, you have to wait. Uh, a little bit. But there is going to be a geometrical interpretation also for those. And um, a, another, another comment is that, again, these fugacities correspond to adding background gauge fields, and these background gauge fields can be complex, and indeed this U can be some complex number. Uh, okay, then uh, an important An important fact is that uh, you can see from here that uh, the values of H of the states that uh, do contribute at the index is fixed by their, by their angular momentum and their R charge. So H is fixed by L and R. So in particular, if I have some RG flow from the UV to the IR of some theory, and uh, along the RG flow, I can conserve a U1R symmetry. So there is a U1R symmetry which is conserved all along. Then uh, the values of H of uh, the states that contributes don't like, uh, like are, are fixed in terms of charges and angular momentum, so they don't change, and the index is independent, is uh, invariant along the RG flow. That's another way of saying that indeed it does not depend on the size, but only on the ratio of L and beta. So you might worry about all sorts of uh, bad things happening to this index, but uh, you, can, 
you can actually check that, uh, for instance, the spectrum of the theory on, uh, on, on the cylinder, uh, provided that uh, the R charges of the fields are in certain bounds, uh, is discrete. So it actually is uh, a pretty well, pretty well behaved object. Um, okay. Oh, sorry, this is J, what? Yeah, yeah. So uh, they're fixed in terms of the spin and the R charges. So, and uh, so in particular, they do not, uh, yeah, it does not depend on the scale. So, um, so as an example, we can just uh, write down what uh, the, I so that, okay, so this in particular means that we can just compute this index in the UV, where we can start from some asymptotically free theory, so we can actually do the computation for the index. It's a computation that you can do in free field theory. And then it tells you something uh, about the IR. Okay, so that's uh, an important comment. Uh, the other uh, interesting uh, fact is that uh, you can actually check, so, so then you can ask, what, what does this index do, compute in the IR? So you can actually check that uh, this uh, SU2 slash 1 times uh, U1, et cetera, uh, times uh, S2R uh, is a subalgebra of the conformal algebra, of the superconformal algebra in, one in 4D. So it's a subalgebra of, uh, what is it, SU4 slash 1. Um, and actually, uh, you can do this for exercise. It's uh, a maximal subalgebra which does not involve on the right hand side any actual conformal transformation of the cylinder. So if you take the uh, superconformal, uh, the n equal one superconformal algebra, and uh, uh, and interpret it as the superconformal algebra on the cylinder, then like uh, you can ask what is uh, the maximum. Well, what is a maximum subalgebra that uh, on the right hand side involves only isometries and not conformal isometries? And uh, so this is uh, the answer. So, that, uh, so then, like by doing a little bit more work, you can uh, check that uh, indeed this index would flow in the IR to the super what is called the superconformal index of the whatever superconformal field theory should uh, live in the deep IR in this RG flow. <coughs> so let me give an example. So the examples are going to be a little bit trivial, but uh, you can find more complicated ones uh, in the literature. You yeah. say the index will flow in the IR? So, so, so no, the index is always the same, but in the IR, it equal, yeah, to the, yeah, it has, so in the IR, it has the interpretation of this other index, right, yeah. It's, uh, yeah, it doesn't flow because it's, uh, yeah, it's actually invariant along the flow. So, okay, so let's consider a chiral field of uh, R charge R so then you can compute this index and uh, what you find is the following. Um, it's a product over J and K. Maybe I should put M and N because they are not related to uh, of one minus P Q to the minus R over two times uh, yeah times P to the M plus one Q to the <coughs> N plus one divided by one minus P times Q to the uh, R over 2 times P to the M, Q to the N. And here I've suppressed the possible uh, fugacities in, in case you want to like charge the chiral field under some other uh, symmetry. But uh, so, so that's the expression for the index. And now we can check that these statements are right, at least in some very simple case. So for instance, uh, Let's suppose that the R charge of uh, our chiral field is one. Well, then that, oops, 
then that means that uh, we could in principle add a mass term to the superpotential because the superpotential will have R charge too. So we can have mass. And then we would expect the field theory to like just uh, go to the empty, to some, I mean, it's gapped in the IR. So let's check what happens if R is equal to one. And indeed, uh, if R is equal to one, you can see that, uh, um, that uh, uh, these guys will become M minus uh, M plus a half. And also here you will get uh, M plus a half from this. And so the numerator and the denominator are the same. And well, uh, if you believe that you can cancel them one by one, uh, I mean, it's an infinite product, but you have to regularize it in some way, then uh, indeed the index uh, is equal to one, which is the cor which means that you only have the vacuum. So that's, uh, that's correct. So then we can also consider another maybe uh, stupid case. Uh, what's the range of for MLM in zero to infinity? Uh, yes, so that you should say M greater than zero. Yeah, they're mm, greater than zero. Yeah, or equal. I think it's equal than zero. Okay, so now we can do another example, which is uh, R equal two. So, but R equal two means that we can just add to the, su to the superpotential a linear piece. So we can take the superpotential to be F times phi, and then supersymmetry is broken. And therefore we sh would expect to find the no supersymmetric vacua. And uh, so let's check what the index is for R equal two. But for R equal two, you can see that uh, for M and N equals zero and R equal two in the numerator, there is a piece which is one minus one that's zero and therefore the index is zero. So it works uh, also, in this, uh, also in this case. So, well, naturally this is uh, not maybe too satisfying, but uh, indeed by using this, uh, di so you can compute, you can take some gauge theory of your choice, uh, compute the index in the DPUV. Uh, this, so, so suppose your gauge theory is some number of, uh, uh, vector multiplet as some number of chiral multiplets. Then you will have uh, factors like this for each of the chiral multiplets, but there will also be fugacity corresponding to the uh, gauge charges. And then in order to impose the gauge symmetry, you'll have to integrate over these fugacities. There will also be some factors for the, for the fields in the, in the vector multiplets, but uh, in total, the index will be some integral over the uh, gauge field fugacities of some expression like these it will be infinite products of p's and q's and uh, indeed these integrals can be there is some theory uh, of uh, how to uh, handle them and you could check for instance that if you have two theories which are ir dual they indeed have the same index so that's a very non-trivial check it's much much more non-trivial than this uh, uh, it's very simple examples. So I just want to give you some reference. Uh, so the original paper on this index was uh, are the ones by uh, Romersberger. So zero five one zero and uh, 0707.3702. Um, so this is actually, the second one is actually the more readable paper. Uh, any question? This expression looks uh, like a particular case of uh, some of these five-dimensional partition functions, uh, the P and Q being the geometric information parameters. Is there a reason for that? Uh, so you would like the P and Q to be the omega deformation parameters. Mm, so I so P and Q are kind of two the yeah, yeah, yeah. data sphere? Not, well, yeah, Geometric well, yeah. yes, yes, mm -hmm. they do. Like, I mean, at least one is certainly can be interpreted some, uh, some rotationally. Yeah, they, they, they do correspond to J left and J right, yes, with some combinations. 
But, uh, so, okay, I don't know of uh, actual realization in 5D where this become the... Well, 5D has more parameters, so there is, for example, the capacity for the instant yeah. on uh, mm -hmm. uh, particles, but so it looks like if you specify it in a special way. Yeah, no, yeah, it might be that there is some, yeah, yeah, that, that there is some background which uh, could be reduced to this. Yes, I, I, I don't know, that's an interesting... It might be that this is 3 is actually 3 uh, inside R4. Inside R4, yeah. Yeah, so there, there should be some background which reduces to this. Maybe some kind of boundary, boundary. Um, that's a very interesting comment. I have, but I, I don't know of any precise relation. Um, okay, so I'll uh, just make some extra comment on what, uh, well, in the spirit of this last uh, comment by, by Nikita, we can think about using this background that uh, we have on the uh, S3 times uh, S1, uh, also to say something about the uh, theories in 3D. So in particular, if you have an n equal 1 theory in 4D uh, with a U1R symmetry and you reduce down to 3D, then you will get an n equal 2 3D theory with U1R symmetry. And uh, so we can think about, well, we have this background with all these isometries. Maybe we can reduce it and get some interesting things in 3D. So one thing we can do is uh, to take our S3. And the S3 is a fibration over S2. So we can reduce along the off fiber. So because nothing depends on, uh, on uh, SU2 right, then we can take the off fiber aligned with S2 right and reduce along that. All the supercharges are going to stay, uh, and we are going to get a background which is the uh, 3D, the so-called 3D index. So that will be S2 times S1. Uh, so that's, this is S3 times S1. We have S2 times S1. Uh, so it's the usually called the index. There is another way of preserving supersymmetry on S2 times S1, so that uh, corresponds to do a doing a twist on the, on the S2 with uh, U1R symmetry. So that's, uh, th that's a different one. Uh, and then we can also reduce just uh, along, we can just place our theory on S3 times S1, and then we can reduce along this one and get a theory on S3. And again, this theory, both these theories will have four supercharges. And uh, so the four supercharges for the 3D theory on S3 have, are going to have the same properties of uh, these. They're both going to transform only under uh, S2 left and be inert under S2 right. Uh, which means that you can actually squash the S3 uh, in various ways. And people have, uh, have studied various possible squashings, which preserve four, even four or less uh, of, the, of the supercharges. Can you, can you take a linear combination of you know, S1 and the isometry of S3? S3? Yeah, so, I so, so, what, yeah, so what you can do is that uh, you can uh, glue the cylinder after a rotation. And then you can reduce on the on this. Uh, well, if you want, it would be reducing along some twisted thing, uh, as you were saying. And then what you get is instead of S3 is the squashed version. With the rational squashing? No, not rational. I mean, you, you can you can just decide to like uh, uh, to take this uh, S3 here and uh, <coughs> identify it with the S3 here after rotation of an angle, yeah, arbitrary. arbitrary angle, and then you get an arbitrary squashing. You don't get the most general squashing in this way, but you get uh, a good, a good, um, yeah, some. Uh, so all this squashing will, in particular, preserve four supercharges because they only involve the S2 right. Uh, okay, so there is still one extra comment on this, uh, which is the interpretation in 3D of uh, the uh, of the background uh, flavor background fields for the flavor symmetries. So as we said, in 
here we can add a background gauge fields, which couple, let's call them, uh, I don't know, a little emu flavor, which couple to the um, uh, conserved flavor symmetries of your theory. And these can be, in principle, uh, complex. So they have a real and an imaginary part. So you can try to interpret what uh, this real and imaginary part will uh, be on S3. And uh, well, <coughs> the real part of MU <coughs> is just something which, so you, you, can, you can imagine, like it just uh, shifts uh, the R current by something proportional to the uh, flavor current. So when you write the theory on S3, there will be various couplings uh, to, the, uh, to the R current, in the same way as we had couplings to the R current in 4D. And uh, the coefficients of these couplings can be shifted by turning on this uh, flavor fugacities. And the imaginary ones become real masses uh, on the S3. So on the S3, you have uh, the possibility of turning on uh, real masses. And those are encoded. Uh, in this dimensional reduction in the imaginary part of the flavor fugacities. OK, so I think this uh, exhausts what uh, I can say about uh, this index, at least for now. So I will jump to a somewhat different subject unless there are questions. OK, no questions. Then I was told that I'm pretty bad with these uh, blackboards, so I should uh, try to be better. Sorry. Can you say something about the generalization to 4D n equals 2? Uh, yes, I can say something, but it's not going to. OK, this is a, a complicated topic. But uh, let me just make uh, some remarks. So first of all, it's uh, obvious that uh, if you take an n equal to theory, it's also n equal 1. And it has a u1 r symmetry. You can just take the Cartan su2. So you can put it on this, uh, on this background. Uh, now, you, you would think that this would break the su2 r symmetry to u1. But actually, if you do things carefully, you discover that that is not the case. Um, so the corresponding background in n equal 2 will preserve eight supercharges. And uh, unfortunately, it's not particularly useful because so one thing which makes this background useful is that if you look at the Lagrangian uh, that I wrote down, for instance, for the chiral field, uh, it depends on the R charges of the, of the fields. And uh, in particular, if the R charges are between 0 and 2, then like, uh, there is an actual potential for the, um, for the chiral fields, which is it's some kind of like mass term like which goes down like 1 over r squared so when the manifold is very small there is a very there is a large uh, there is a large trap for the fields so they are trapped uh, near the origin in field space so that makes the computation resilient to all sorts of uh, so there are no flat directions uh, but if you do the similar computation in n equal 2 then when you reduce from N equal, so when you go from n equal 2 to n equal 1, the R symmetry of uh, the resulting field, it turns up that there is some field of R charge 0. And then this field has a flat direction. And uh, it makes using this background much less, uh, less obvious. So that's, uh, that's one comment. Uh, there are many more comments that I can make about n equal 2, but uh, we will uh, leave it for later, because it will take a long time. OK, so if there are no other questions on this, um, I will uh, skip uh, to a somewhat different topic. So I, I, I said at various points that uh, this uh, idea of coupling uh, to background supergravity was useful because it would allow us to uh, classify what are the possible uh, manifolds on which we can place a certain theory preserving some amount of supersymmetry. So, uh, so in particular, let's see how this works uh, for, new minim for the case of uh, n equal 1 theories with a u1 r symmetry. Which, as we said, uh, couple to uh, new minimal supergravity. 
So the generalized killing spinner equation, uh, in this case, uh, we wrote it last time, but I'll rewrite it again, as the following form. And then there is another uh, equivalent equation for the zeta tildes. Uh, but because this equation only involves zetas and the other equation only involves zeta tildes, we can just forget about the other one for now and look for what manifolds which have one solution, I mean backgrounds which allow for one solution to this equation. Okay? So, so some comments. Again, so we are working in Euclidean space. So that means that if I take a spinner, zeta, alpha, and uh, a complex conjugate, uh, its components, I don't get the components of zeta tilde, but I get the components of another spinner, let's call it uh, zeta dagger, uh, which also transforms uh, as a left-handed one, but uh, with an upper index. <coughs> okay, so this is, if you want, is the, by defini the definition of uh, zeta dagger. And uh, with this definition, then you can check that zeta dagger zeta is just equal to the absolute value of zeta 1 square plus the absolute value of zeta 2 squared. So one thing you have a little bit careful about is that if you take the complex conjugate of zeta with upper indices, this is going to give minus zeta dagger with lower indices. Okay, so you can check this. But Okay, so this will be, um, so this is one comment. So the other comment is that, as we said last time, this uh, spinner zeta is charged under the U1R symmetry, so that it actually uh, lives into the U1, the unitary line bundle corresponding to the uh, U1R symmetry times uh, SU2 plus, this like left-handed uh, spin bundle. So in for a generic manifold, uh, this uh, SU2 plus does bundle, the spin bundle does not exist, but uh, any uh, orientable manifold in 4D is spin C, and uh, in spin C, this uh, line bundle, unitary line bundle times S2 is, can be well defined. So that's, uh, so in principle we can work on any orientable manifold, but uh, there will be constraints on the kind of theory we can put in. Uh, we will uh, comment on that later. Okay, so then there is another somewhat uh, trivial uh, point that one can make, is that, uh, well, this equation has at most two uh, uh, non-trivial solutions. So how, how do we see that? Well, the first thing that it's clear is that this is like uh, homogeneous in zeta, and uh, it has first derivatives only. So if zeta is equal to zero at some point, then the derivative of zeta is going to be zero, and then that means that uh, zeta is equal to zero everywhere. Oh, well, at least in some open set, I don't know. Uh, so that means that if you have uh, uh, more than two solutions, you can always take linear combinations of them, which uh, are going to be zero, and then uh, that means that they are trivial. Okay, so in particular, this same point tells you that if there is a non-trivial solution, then z must be different than zero everywhere. And as we'll see, this, uh, just this fact has uh, some uh, very important consequences. So it's up to an what you mean. What? So what you just said means that if it exists, it's unique up to an uh, The solution? Yes. There can be two solutions. Can be two solutions? Yeah, because the... What about the argument that you take linear combination which vanishes at some point? And then vanishes everywhere. 
No, but you have two components of zeta. They don't live in the line bundle. Okay. Uh, okay, so... I suspect it's useful if you say what spin C structure is. Uh, okay, this is going to take me a while. Let, let's, let's say if people are interested, I can, uh, I, I can comment on that uh, uh, separately. Otherwise, I won't be finishing this. Uh, so let's see. Um, all right, so now, uh, okay, I'm going to mess with the blackboards maybe. Let's see. You can put this up. And uh, I can write on this one. Okay, so now we can, in order to continue to study this equation, uh, it is useful to just uh, make some uh, statements uh, which do not even use them. They just use the fact that uh, the solution is uh, nowhere vanishing. So for instance, we can construct the following object uh, for which I've chosen an appropriate name. by using, suppose we have a solution, then we can build up this, uh, this object. So let's make some uh, general comments. So first of all, you can notice that uh, there is a zeta at the numerator, but there is also a zeta at the denominator. There is a zeta dagger at the numerator and a zeta dagger at the denominator. So that means that this, uh, this is actually uncharged under the complexified uh, U1R. So it is a good tensor uh, on the manifold and it is a good tensor because zeta is nowhere vanishing so I can divide by the norm squared. It's, uh, this object has no zeros. So this is a good, uh, it's a good tensor and uh, we can try to figure out some properties of this tensor by just uh, using Firth's identities. So you're welcome to check these uh, in your spare time. So you can multiply two of these, and uh, what you find is minus the identity. And uh, you can also check that uh, if I take g mu nu, well, that's basic, a nu lambda, What uh, did I write here? Yeah, there, I mean. Oh, yeah, yeah, I have, uh, I have some. Blah. Okay, so what does this mean? So it means that this uh, thing J is uh, an almost complex structure. This is more or less the definition of an almost complex structure. Um, and uh, also that the metric is compatible with this almost complex structure. Okay, so fine. So from this, we can already draw an interesting conclusion, which is if you have a solution, then there is an almost complex structure. Therefore, for instance, we can exclude that we will ever able to uh, find the force sphere as a solution to our uh, to our equation, because the force sphere does not allow for an almost complex structure. So that's out. So as we saw, we can realize the force sphere, but uh, for theories which couple to old minimal supergravity and not uh, to new minimal supergravity. OK, so now we have an almost complex structure. It's natural to ask, like, uh, does, this, uh, does this object uh, actually uh, is, this a, is this object actually a complex structure or not? Uh, so for that, uh, you have to check that uh, uh, this tensor with a name that I cannot pronounce. Not, 
Yes. It's confusing. Uh, when we did uh, with Volker yesterday or the day before uh, the S4 localization for N equal to 2, we had the uh, killing spinners that they can be zero at the North Pole or the South Pole. Yes, let me answer that question. So the N equal to killing spinner equations or the N equal 1 killing spinner equations in old minimum, uh, they are different in such that uh, they also have zeta tilde on the other side. Okay, so that means that it is possible to find solutions where either zeta or zeta tilde vanishes at some point. Not, however, both zeta and zeta tilde, because th the same comments goes through that if both zeta and zeta tilde are equal to zero, then you will find uh, that uh, the solution is everywhere zero. Um, so indeed, for instance, on uh, Peston's theory on S4, like uh, the left-handed part of the spinner which uh, gives the supercharge vanishes at the North Pole and the right-handed vanishes at the other pole or vice versa. <coughs> okay, so as I said, it's natural when you have an almost complex structure to check if it is actually complex. So for this, like, uh, you can do two things. Either you can check that uh, this tensor, the Neunhaus tensor vanishes, so I can write down what this is. And hopefully I get uh, the indices right. So I'm writing this just so that you see that uh, it just involves J and the derivatives of J. So if this is a complex structure, then this object better be zero. So then you know what J is, you know what equations zeta satisfies, you can find what equation zeta dagger satisfies by taking the complex conjugate. Then you just can plug in and, uh, well, and you can compute, or maybe if you're good with uh, some computer, you can have the computer compute for you and you find that uh, it is indeed zero. So this is a pretty horrible computation, but uh, there is actually a simple computation that maybe you can uh, try to do, which is the following. So you can check that uh, if you have an holomorphic vector, then x mu sigma tilde mu zeta is equal to zero. And then an equivalent characterization of a complex structure is uh, uh, something for which the commutator of two holomorphic vector is also called holomorphic. So if you take x mu and uh, y mu holomorphic, which means with only uh, such that uh, one minus ij on them is zero, then uh, the commutator should also be holomorphic. And by using that an holomorphic vector satisfies this condition, it's actually much easier to check this. You just take a derivative of this, and then you dot it uh, with another holomorphic vector, and then you just uh, antisymmetrize some indices, and uh, you get the result pretty, pretty easily. So as a conclusion, we have that uh, if there is a supercharge, so zeta super uh, satisfying those equations, <laughs> implies that uh, the manifold is complex and that the metric is compatible with the complex structure, which means that uh, if we choose appropriate uh, uh, coordinates, we can uh, write it as uh, uh, so ds squared it's going to be g i i bar d z i d z bar i bar. So in particular, the metric does not have any g i j or g i bar j bar um, components. So 
So are there any questions so far? So is a statement that if there is a solution to the generalization? Yeah, so if there is a solution to those equations, then uh, from that solution you can build a complex structure, therefore your manifold is, is complex, and the metric is a mission. Uh, so just a, a characterization of a complex manifold is that uh, I can cover it in patches and I can choose corn on each patch I can choose complex coordinates zi's uh, in which the metric for instance will get uh, that form and uh, in going from one patch to another so this is the important part, the transition functions between one patch and another are holomorphic functions of the coordinate. So the, the new coordinate zi prime are holomorphic functions of the, of the z's. Okay? So you can cover your manifold in complex in, in patches which look like C2 and then like uh, in going from patch to patch you just change uh, the coordinate as with holomorphic functions. Okay, so this uh, is uh, showing that if there is a solution then the manifold is complex. Uh, now we can try to go in reverse and show that if the manifold is complex then we have a solution. Okay, so that's uh, the, that is what uh, we'll try to do in the following. So now if the manifold is complex and if you're using spin structure, then your zetas will become now what, one zero forms or, or, or zero zero and zero two? Well, uh, the, the zetas will become a scalar. The supercharge will correspond to a scalar. scalar? Yes, and uh, so and with the supercharge I can also build uh, an holomorphic two form. I, I, give me a second. And and then can you write back that mark that you say in, uh, in, uh, in more geometric? Yes, then one can twist various, uh, I mean, are you talking about trying to write down some twisting? You already have. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, uh, global subsymmetry, if you can just rewrite the Lagrangian and more geometric. Yes, yes, that can be done. Uh, I. Okay, so that's one thing I could try to show tomorrow, but I don't know, like, depending on what people are interested in, in hearing about. Um, Okay, so, <coughs> um, let's see if I wanted to say something else, I don't think so. Oh, okay, w one thing which is important is that uh, you notice that uh, the um, complex structure that uh, I have uh, written down uh, is, um, is self-dual, just because uh, sigma mu nu uh, is self-dual. So that uh, will uh, be somewhat important. So that's just a manifestation that it can be built out of zeta, which is a, a left-handed spinner. If instead you add uh, a solution to the other killing spinner equation, the one for the right-handed spinners, then again, you could be able to write down a complex structure, but that would be anti-self-dual. But the same comments uh, will go through. <coughs> okay, so let me make a comment first about, let, let's look at this, uh, at this equation that I wrote there and uh, let's just set v to zero. So then it just looks like uh, d mu minus i a mu of z equals zero. So you might want to ask wh when, when can I solve such equation? And uh, well, the answer is that you basically want uh, the uh, holonomy of uh, the levi civita connection, uh, well, so the alonomy of levi civita connection in general would be in S2 plus, I mean, S2 plus times S2 minus, uh, but uh, you, you would like the S2 left part, uh, the S2 plus part, the one under which the zeta transforms, uh, to just be U1. So if that's true, then you can twist away the, so if the alonomy of the levi civita connection is U1, times S U two minus instead of uh, S U two plus times S U two minus, then you would be able to twist away 
the U1 part by using the U1 uh, R symmetry. And uh, indeed, this can be done on Kähler manifolds. So this happens on Kähler manifolds. Again, you want your complex structure to be self-dual so that uh, the U1 will be in the right place. If it's uh, anti-self-dual, then you will do it with the zeta tilde. OK, so that's a comment, but it gives in, in spirit what you would want to accomplish. So this can be accomplished on Kähler manifolds, but we would like to show that if we have the extra freedom of adding this other background field V, then we can do this on uh, uh, any complex manifold. But does it really imply Kähler or just Hermitian complex? Uh, well, I think it's true for Kähler. But I'm not well, completely Kähler certain. Yes, uh, I'm not completely sure about the reverse. Um, OK, so, so in order to proceed, Let's OK, so the <coughs> one thing that we can look at are derivative, covariant derivatives of uh, the complex structure. Um, so actually, I think yes, because of what I'm going to say. So, so it's a fact that uh, the covariant in if the manifold is complex then the covariant derivatives of the complex structure uh, they are not all independent uh, but uh, they are actually all encoded into the divergence okay so in order to check this you have to use the horrible tensor being zero. Um, OK. So then, uh, if this object is zero, then the manifold is scalar. And then you can just set v equals zero and use this trick to solve your killing spinner equation. Um, if this object is non-zero, what uh, we want to show is that uh, we can make use of v to accomplish the same. OK? So, sorry. Yeah, yeah, this is the divergence. Maybe I should write it more carefully. So the, the statement is that if the manifold is complex, then all the derivatives of the complex structure are encoded into the divergence. That's a statement that uh, in order to check it, you have to use the, the fact that J is an actual complex structure and not an almost complex structure. OK, so let's compute this object by using the killing spinner equation. So you have to take a derivative of, uh, of j, and then you have to plug in uh, the equation. And uh, what you get is that this is uh, v uh, mu plus v bar mu plus i, uh, no. These are mu's. Mu minus v bar mu times j mu nu. OK. So it's not 0. And uh, the fact it is the non zero, the fact that it's non zero is encoded in v. In particular, you can invert this relation. And you can write v in terms of the divergence of the complex structure. But this does not completely determine v. There is still something that you can add, u mu. And uh, remember that v has to be conserved. Uh, it's an auxiliary field in the, in the supergravity multiplet, which is uh, a conserved vector. So that means that, OK, so this piece works. It's uh, conserved. Then this piece also needs to be separately conserved. So grad mu, so the divergence of v mu is 0, uh, of u mu is 0. 
and then in order for this to solve that, you also need uh, to impose that uh, the anti-holomorphic components of U are zero. Okay. So this encodes some freedom of uh, choosing V, which is not completely determined by the complex structure of your manifold. So you choose a manifold, it will have some complex structure, then this, uh, this complex structure is gonna, if it's, so if the manifold is not scalar, it's gonna tell you what V mu has to be, up to changing the anti-holomorphic components by a conserved uh, part. Okay. <coughs> Now, uh, to conclude, uh, you have to use uh, uh, another fact uh, about uh, complex manifold, uh, which is, the f so uh, as you see here, like the covariant derivative of the complex structure is not zero, it's encoded in V. But uh, um, if you change, con if instead of working with the levi civita connection, you choose a different connection, you can choose a connection such that uh, it is compatible with the metric. So I'm going to claim that uh, there exists a connection that is uh, compatible with the metric. And it's also compatible with the complex structure. So and j you knew. So this, uh, uh, this connection uh, goes, well actually there is more than one, there is an entire one parameter family of such connections, uh, but uh, we are going to choose one in particular which is called the churn, the churn connection. So the definition of the churn connection is that, like uh, say we write down the spin connection omega mu nu rho for the CERN connection, that is going to be the Levi Civita one, the one that you all know about. Uh, but then you have to subtract a piece which uh, is, uh, gives the contortion tensor. And the contortion tension is uh, uh, determined by the complex structure uh, in the following way. Okay, where this is just the Levi Civita spin connection. <coughs> okay, so the claim is that uh, if you use this uh, spin connection, then it is compatible both with the metric and with the complex structure. So it makes sense to use this one instead of the uh, instead of the instead of the churn connection. And why is that? Well, it's because because this connection is compatible with Jamie Nu, its holonomy is going to be in U1 times SU2. So, what did they call it? Plus? So, that's because if you take, uh, you, you can, when the manifold is complex, you can take frames which are holomorphic and then like in going from patch to patch you can just uh, yeah, so you, you can two holomorphic frames are going to be related by a u1 times su2 uh, transformation and because the connection is compatible with the complex structure I can like an holomorphic frame is going to stay holomorphic uh, okay so so now I can try to just take my equation over there and rewrite it in terms of the churn connection instead of the uh, instead of the Levi Civita one. So So let's do it here. 
and let's see what this becomes. So uh, we have to make some redefinition. So we have to use, first of all, that V is now known in terms of the uh, complex structure plus a piece which is undetermined. And then we have to use the fact that we want to change the connection to be the churn one. So after you do all this, you get the following. Where uh, a mu c is just the old u1 r gauge field, a mu, but uh, plus a well-defined one form, which is some function of the complex structure. Okay, so this means that, uh, like, you're, you're, you're just shifting the uh, UNR connection by a well-defined one form, so that's legit. And uh, then you can rewrite that equation in this way. And but now it's clear how you want to solve it, because uh, the claim is that uh, the allonomy of the churn connection is in U1 times S2 plus, but we are just looking at left-handed spinners. So I can just twist away the allonomy by using the U1, the U1R connection. So, so what, what happens to you? The ambigu ambiguous part. Yeah, the ambiguous part drops from the equation. Oh, I see. Uh -huh. Okay, so so we can uh, we can be a little bit more explicit. And uh, how much time do I have left? Like fifteen minutes. Okay. So in order to be a little bit more explicit, let's uh, introduce uh, another object, we'll call it p mu nu, and that's just going to be z sigma mu nu times z. Okay, so this object, uh, you can check uh, in these two indices, it is holomorphic, uh, but then it also has r charge 2 because it, uh, it has two spinners. So, the, so this guy lives... Uh, into the square of the UNR line bundle times um, oops, times the uh, bundle of uh, holomorphic two forms, which uh, is also called the canonical line bundle. Um. <coughs> So you can check that indeed this thing is uh, is a line bundle in the same way as you check that the determinant uh, line bundle is <coughs> a line bundle. Uh, okay, so but this guy is uh, different than zero everywhere. Therefore, this tells you that this uh, object is trivial. And uh, therefore, we can identify L with uh, minus a half of the canonical line bundle so this does not make it well so then L is not going to be well, well defined but uh, L times k to the a half will be and that's basically what you use to construct uh, to construct the spinner <coughs> so very explicitly, we can take some uh, coordinate patch. So in some coordinate patch, we can take the component 1, 2 of p, uh, and we can call this little p. Then we can define another object, s, which is little p times g to the minus a quarter, where g is the determinant of the metric.
Right, so we can uh, we can construct this object, <coughs> and uh, so s is clearly different than zero, and it has uh, it has R charge two, and now you can ask how does s uh, change under uh, changes of coordinates which are holomorphic. So now you do an holomorphic. coordinate change and uh, what you discover is that uh, the new s in the new coordinates uh, is equal to the old s in the old coordinates times a phase and this phase is the determinant of uh, dz prime over dz uh, divided by the determinant of uh, dz bar prime over dz bar to the power a half. So it's important that this thing is a phase. Now S as R charge two. So that means that in going from patch to patch, the like uh, in doing an holomorphic corner change, you can undo it by doing a U and R transformation. So this can be undone. with u on r and uh, therefore under holomorphic coordinate changes followed by appropriate u on r transformations this s transforms like a scalar that's the usual way the spinners are ready to form yes indeed so under holomorphic coordinate changes plus u and r s is a scalar and now we can just use s to construct our spinner uh, as uh, Nikita was saying okay so let's see we can just put this up here so again, this is going to be very, I mean, for people who are not interested in the explicit part, like, you can just uh, forget about it. Like, I mean, the, the global existence of the spinner is already proved, but you can actually write down expressions in uh, each patch. So to write expression in each patch, you have to make some choices. So you have to introduce some frame. So we choose some holomorphic frame, which will be the following one. T u square root of g one one bar is one plus uh, square root of t u over g one one bar e t u one bar is e t u, and uh, e t u is going to be equal to square root of uh, well, square root of t u over g1 1 bar g to the 1 quarter times dz2 so then you can check that uh, the metric is just uh, e1 e1 bar plus e2 e2 bar and uh, that uh, if you do uh, if you change okay that's I think this is enough uh, and then you can just solve in this frame for the killing spinner for the killing spinner equation when written in terms of the uh, of the uh, of the churn connection, which I think I just erased. And what you get is that the solution is z equals square root of s over two times one zero. And uh, you can also get what the components of the churn connection. Uh, of the U and R connection R this is going to be minus I over 8 di of log g minus I over 2 di of log s and uh, ai bar c is uh, I over 8 di bar log g minus I over 2 di bar log s Okay, so uh, in summary, like uh, if you have a complex manifold, you can always find one supercharge at least 
on it, and uh, this supercharge will correspond to, well, it's a complex manifold with a self-dual complex structure. Then, like, you can find a left-handed uh, spinner which solves the new minimal equations, and therefore you get at least one supercharge, and the supercharges are charge one, and it will square to zero. Okay? I over two or one over two? Uh, I over two. Yeah, I think, uh, sorry, that's uh, my horrible. Uh, okay, so that, uh, uh, are there any questions on this? So in some sense, this is just, uh, w once you realize that uh, you can change connections to the churn connection and the, with that change, the equation looks exactly like uh, the one Keller manifolds, it's uh, the same story. Uh, it's not uh, very different. Um, okay, so uh, there are some more comments I can make about what if uh, we want manifolds with more than, which allow more than one just supercharge. We could, uh, we could try to find manifolds that have uh, two uh, or more. And now there are different choices. So you can ask for two independent zetas, so two independent supercharges with the same R charge. So I'm not gonna say much about this case here because it's uh, complicated and also I don't know the answer completely. So what we found is that uh, in the case the manifold is uh, compact, then this is a very restrictive uh, um, this is a very restrictive requirement. Uh, and uh, in the case the manifold is non-compact, there are some differential equations for the metric and that you have to satisfy and it's not clear uh, what the most gen general solution is. So this is not, uh, but the other, another case which is interesting is uh, to ask for, so this is for two z's, uh, for one z and one z tilde, so one solution to the, to one, so you want one supercharge with r charge one and one supercharge with r charge minus one. Well, then it's clear that your manifold will uh, have a complex structure J mu nu, but it also have uh, another complex structure J tilde mu nu, which is gonna be anti-self-dual instead of uh, self-dual. Uh, but as it turns out, this is not the best way to, the, to describe this manifold. It's much easier to work with the bilinear of Z and Z tilde. So you can just build out Z sigma mu Z tilde, and as we said in the last lecture, this is a killing vector, k mu. So you can check various things about this killing vector. So first of all, you can check that uh, k uh, is holomorphic <coughs> with respect to j and j tilde. And uh, you can also check that uh, if you take k and you square it, you get zero. It's a complex killing vector, so that's not uh, unreasonable. And uh, finally, uh, you also find out uh, that uh, its norm, well, okay, that's not too important. Um, its norm is non-zero because both of the z and z tilde are no, everywhere non-zero, different than zero, okay? And then there are actually expressions for j mu nu and j tilde mu nu in terms of k. So j mu nu can be written as some object q plus a half of uh, epsilon mu nu rho lambda q rho lambda, uh, where q is uh, i over the absolute value of k squared times uh, k mu k bar nu minus k nu k bar mu. Okay. Um, so now there are like uh, two different cases that... Uh, On the left side it's nu nu or it's... Mu nu nu mu. Mu nu nu mu. Oh, what? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, sorry, so this is mu, and this, maybe I should just put mn, nm. 
Is it better? Okay. Um, Uh, yeah, J tilde would be with the opposite sign. One is self-dual and the other one is anti-self-dual. Um, okay, so now there are two cases. Uh, case one, uh, K uh, commuted with K bar uh, is different than zero. Okay, so then you have to do some work and you discover that this implies that the manifold is S3 times S1, well, or S3 times R. And uh, so, okay, we already know about that. Uh, case number two is the case when they commute. So this is more or less intuitive, right? Because if it's non-zero, then you start getting more than two killing vectors and they have to form an algebra. So what that could, there are not many options. Um, okay, so in this case, they are, if they are zero, they commute and then you can actually write down uh, as an expression for the metric. So what you discover is that uh, your manifold, so these two vector fields are gonna generate a torus action on your manifold. And the torus never shrinks to zero side because the norm of the killing vector is always uh, different than zero. And then you can write down what uh, the metric of the manifold will be. There will be some conformal factor uh, dependent on some co a complex coordinate z, which is never zero. And then we'll have some coordinate dw plus h zz bar dz times uh, dw bar plus h bar zz bar dz bar plus some function c zz bar dz dz bar. And uh, this omega square is equal to 2 <coughs> the norm of k squared. So in this case, uh, I think K is just uh, DW. Okay. So I think I should stop, but uh, I'm yeah I'm gonna say a little bit more about this next time. H and H bar and C are arbitrary functions. Yeah, h and h bar and c are arbitrary functions. So this tells you how the torus is fibered over the base, and this is the metric over the base. So in particular, next time we'll see that, uh, well, s3 times s1 is indeed of this form. Any other question? Okay. I think everybody's uh, sweltering. <laughs>